just uh, get things going here. Um, so just a reminder that this session is being recorded and uh, will be uploaded to WordPress TV. Um, with that in mind, you know, please do turn on your video. You know, it'd be great to see you all, but please remain muted during the presentation. So uh, this session is going to be a presentation about the interactivity API. Um, it's not a panel or discussion. There's various formats for the developer hours. This one is going to be a presentation um, by, uh, it's going to be presented by Mario. It's going to be assisted by Lewis. I'll get them to introduce themselves um, shortly. Um, if you haven't already seen it, let me, uh, let me just grab the link here and put it in the chat. This is the link to the proposal post about the interactivity API. And uh, Here's a link to the project repository on GitHub. So you can satiate your curiosity there. <clears throat> so with that out the way, I'll introduce uh, Mario, who's going to be leading the presentation. So Mario, would you uh, like to introduce yourself, say a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the development of the Interactivity API? Sure. Thanks, Michael. So I'm Mario. I'm from Spain, and well, I'm I'm part of the group of contributors that have been working in the Interactivity API. We are currently working on on improving the whole block developer experience, development experience, and this is like the first step. <laughs> so yeah, we come from Frontity, that it was a startup, and we were creating a React framework for WordPress. And now we shift to be core contributors and we are implementing our knowledge to to bring those experiences into WordPress itself. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Mario is going to be assisted by Lewis. Uh, Lewis, would you like to say a little bit about yourself and your involvement in the development of the sure. API? Sure, it's pretty similar to, to Mario. Uh, also involved in the group of contributors working on the Interactivity API, trying to figure out how to enable these kind of new features of or capabilities for WordPress. And also previously, uh, I worked on the on this Frontity framework, which was a React framework for headless WordPress. And yeah, and we moved to we stopped uh, Frontity and. and uh, focused on on WordPress core because yeah we believe that uh, full site editing is is the future of building uh, sites with WordPress so yeah instead of trying to build uh, user experiences like more rich user experiences with external tools like uh, in our case it was Frontity but any other of the headless solutions we want to bring those same capabilities to, to WordPress itself. So it can be used with uh, the full potential of the blocks. Amazing, thank you. And full disclosure, I used to work with Mario and <laughs> Lewis at Frontity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's gonna be, as I said, this is gonna be a presentation led by Mario. There's gonna be an opportunity for Q and A. So if you've got a question, you know, either ask it in the chat or raise your hand and um, hopefully we'll get around to answering all the questions. So Mario, are you happy for people to ask questions during the presentation or do you want to do the presentation and have Q and A at the end? How do you want to play it? Mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe <laughs> wait for the Q and A because maybe some of the questions are answered later in the sure. session. That makes I don't sense. Know. Okay. We'll, sure. we'll run if the you feel it's relevant, we can't stop. It's not a problem. Okay. We'll <laughs> run the presentation and we'll do the QA at the end. Okay. But yeah, I mean, but as questions come up in your minds, 
you know, put them in the chat. Um, yeah. And we'll get around to answering you. Um, let me just run through some announcements quickly before we get started. Um, as I'm sure you already know, WordPress 6.2 is out, came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it's um, ready for use. Um, there's the link. Um, also just launched recently is the new developer blog, which has uh, articles, uh, technical articles targeted at developers. There's a link to that if you're not already aware of it. Um, yeah, so WordPress 6.2 has just come out. So that means WordPress 6.3 is in the planning and development stage. You can get involved. Uh, WordPress is open source, so anyone can contribute. There's a link to uh, the WordPress 6.3 planning. Um, WordPress Europe, of course, is happening on the 8th to the 10th of June. Uh, since this We've got two of these sessions, by the way. One is going to be targeted at America's time zones. This one is for uh, Asia Pacific and EMEA. And so uh, because this one's targeted at EMEA, the WordPress Europe will, um, I'm sure, be of interest to you. Uh, WordPress US, in case you can make that, is happening earlier this year than usual. That's in August, the 24th to the 26th of August. And um, if you can't make either of those, now that the pandemic is pretty much over to all intents and purposes, local word camps are now happening. And you can find out all about a word camp happening near you by visiting central.wordcamp.org. And there's the link in the chat. OK, so with those preliminaries out the way, I will hand it over to Mario. Take it away, Mario. OK, thanks, Michael. So, well, first, for those who have read the proposal, you may already know, but let's explain briefly what the Interactivity API is for. Basically, we want to provide a standard way to create, to add front-end interactivity to your blogs. Until now, Gutenberg has been focused mostly on the blog editor, and there was an intentional gap in the front-end of your blogs, so the Interactivity API aims to cover that gap. So imagine functionalities like like this post or add to cart or, for example, the instant search or full page transitions or comments form without page reload. Those are the user experiences that we want to enable and we want them to be easy to be created in WordPress. So that's what the Interactivity API is for, just to clarify. <laughs> And my idea for this session was to start showing some some of these examples and then take a look at the requirements and show some code examples and go through them. So let's start if if you want. I can share my screen. Okay, not this. Yeah. Okay. We created this movies demo site in order to show the interactivity experience interactivity interactive experiences that we are talking about. For example, here I can I can like these movies and we can see that the blocks in the top are updated and the count is, is going up. I can also do pagination here and we can see that the page is now reloaded, everything is handled in the client and we can see that it feels almost instant. It's because we are prefetching all the pages aggressively in this demo. I can also go to to the movies and we can see that the that the count are, is still there and the likes are still there. I can also play the trailer and it's gonna open this pop-up here that is another block and the video is gonna keep playing. And oops. And the way we are doing the diffing, well the interactivity API is doing the diffing, is intelligent enough to understand what parts of the page need to change. And the ones, the ones that don't change mm, are not updated. So this allows us to keep, for example, in this video, while I'm navigating, it's still playing, it's not refreshed, and I can go to another movie and it's going to be there. And similar to that, we also have the instant search. Here, if I start typing, you can see that the results are automatically updated and the video is, is still playing. And all of this, 
it has to be compatible and it actually is compatible with the block templating system. For example, here I'm in the block in the editor side of the movies. So if I make any change to the templates, it's going to be automatically reflected in the front end and the interactive blocks are going to remain interactive. Let's see an example. I can add here in the, I'm in the search template. So I can add a new block here. Let's add a row. And I can add some paragraphs like this movie. And I can insert an interactive block like the like icon, for example. And we can see that this is how you usually work with blocks. Is you, you have here all the styles. I can center the items here in the paragraph. I can change the color of the text to be white, for example. And if I save this and I go back to, to the page and I refresh it, if now I start searching, we can see that the changes that we made to the template are directly here and the interactive blocks that we included remain interactive. You can see that the, the likes are, are applied. So this is it. This is what the interactivity API is for. These are some of the use cases. So we can jump now into the examples. First, a couple of warnings. <laughs> this is still experimental. We are checking what are the best APIs and approaches. And another important part is that um, this is meant for the front end of your blocks. It doesn't, it doesn't handle the block editor side that keeps working as it's working right now. In the future, we will like, well, actually we are exploring the possibility to integrate both things and you can use reuse code both for the editor and, and the front end, but that's um, for now, it's out of the of this initial proposal. So yeah, let's see how this is implemented and what we are proposing actually. What we want is, as I said, a standard system. And this API is right now a standard system based on directives. For those who don't know, directives are just custom attributes that we are adding to the HTML tags that tell the interactivity API the behaviors that needs to be attached to the DOM elements or even modify them. It's kind of similar to Alpine GS for those familiar with it but especially designed to work with WordPress. So let's, let's dive into the examples that is going to be easier to, to explain. For that, we created some, some interactive blocks. This is a really simple example with a toggle that when I click the button, it's going to show some text and it's going to console log the hidden property in the console. So if I toggle this, it's going to say hidden true. And we replicated exactly the same behavior using React to show the difference. This one is using the interactivity API, and this one is using React. As you can see, the functionality is exactly the same, but we will see later the differences between the code and, and some edge cases. Mm, so yeah, I think we can go into the code now. Let me check. Yeah, here we have in the left how the block is built using the interactivity API. And in the right, we have the same block using React. For building the block using the interactivity API, the workflow of creating blocks remains the same. It, yeah, it is just a new API that you can use. So basically, you have to do two things. You have to add the directives to your markup. It doesn't. It doesn't need to be a dynamic block like this one. It can also work with static blocks, but you have to add the directive to your markup. And then you have to create the store that is the one handling the, the JavaScript logic. So yeah, let's see this example to clarify what we mean with this. These are the custom attributes. These are the directives. In this example, we are adding here data WP context that is meant to be used to create local state. So here we are defining an object with the hidden true property. And this, this state, this local state, is available to this node and all its all its children. And they can be used in the in the actions and effects as we will see later. Here, an important note is that this is local state, but it's also possible to create global state 
we can do that directly in the store. I could create here a state and add some properties that would be available not only to this node and its children, but to, to any node in, in the page. Then we are adding an, another directive here, that data WP effect, that is calling the effects log show defined in the store. And here in the JavaScript part in the store, we can see that we are just defining this effect that is console logging the, the hidden property. It's getting the context and is is console logging the, the hidden property. So the data WP effect runs each time that this property is changed. So it's going to console log the hidden property when we toggle it. Then in the same button, we have data WP on click that is calling this action, action session plugin toggle. And yeah, this is just a simple action to, to toggle the context. And finally, we also have data WP bind dot hidden. This directive is meant to be used to, to change the value of some HTML attributes. In this case, we are attaching the value of context hidden to the hidden HTML attributes. If we take a look at the React example, we can see that all the logic that you define in React or JavaScript frameworks like use state, use effect, the toggle function, these conditionals, this is moved to directives. So in the case of use state, this is the local state that you define in, in React. It would be equivalent to data, data WP context. Here, the use effect that you, the hook that you use in React is equivalent to data WP effect. And here we can see that we are defining the console log in the use effect is the same we are defining here. Then we have the toggle function that we are defining in the store with the actions. And then here we are adding some conditionals to, to change the hidden attribute of the HTML. And we, for that, we are using data WP by. And I think that's it regarding the examples. Luis, feel free to interrupt me if you want to add something. <laughs> I didn't say it, but... No problem. Okay, so these are the same blocks that we were shown. Here it's important to note that, as you can see, we are using HTML as the templating system, and it comes with some benefits. The main one being that this can be understood by PHP. So it can support server-side rendering, it can support the WordPress hooks that we will see now. We are going to go now through the requirements that we defined before researching the best approach, and we will see how they are met with these directives implementation. So yeah, I think regarding how a block is built using directives, this is it. You need to add directives to your markup and create the store with the JavaScript logic. That's the summary, kind of. So we can go now to the requirements or goals. These are the initial goals that we defined uh, before researching the different approaches. We consider different alternatives. And at the end, we decided to go with directives because mm, it was the system that was meeting these goals. So let's take a quick look at them. We have here block first and PHP friendly and related to that, it has to be backward compatible as everything in WordPress and extensible. With this means, we mean that, yeah, it has to be designed to work in the, in the blocks world and it has to be PHP friendly. It has to support server-side rendering. It has to support WordPress APIs like WordPress hooks or translations. And it has to be as extensible as WordPress is, is right now. Plugins can extend functionalities and, and all those things that WordPress does great. Then we also wanted it to be declarative and reactive. This means that whenever you change the state, it automatically reflects in in the in the page in a reactive way. We wanted it to be as performant as possible. It has to be atomic and composable, so you have a small reusable parts that can help to create more complex systems, and it has to be compatible with the existing block development tooling. This means that you don't need extra tools to to create your interactive blocks. So those are the goals. Let's see now how they are met 
with the interactivity API. Let's start with the block first and PHP friendly and backward compatibility and extensibility. As I said, we are using HTML as the templating system, and that makes it um, compatible with blocks and PHP. It supports server -side rendering, which is is important. It's something that we take from from granted using WordPress, but um, the current approaches to add interactivity to your blocks usually have issues with server -side rendering. Let's take an, a look at our example again. If I refresh this, but using a slow network, we can see the difference. The differences between the two blocks. We saw the saw text be, before before it disappeared. This is because from the server side rendering, we are getting that text, and React is the one hydrating it and hiding it. And as React doesn't have support for server side rendering, it's causing this this layout shift or, well, in this, this is a really basic example, but imagine you have some images and they disappear. It can create some layout uh, shifts that can create a poor user experience. Let me refresh it again so we can see it. We can see now the sun text and when React, React hydrates, the text is hidden. It remains, now it's interactive, but you have that problem from, from the server. You could also remove completely the server -side rendering, but then you would have problems with SEO, for example. So it's not it's not the best user experience. And yeah, here I think it's important to know that you could do server -side rendering in React using Node, for example, Node.js, but that's not something that all WordPress can do and not all hostings are gonna have node.js available so that was one of the we were exploring the possibility to use react for this and that was one of the main blockers and yeah, related to this we also have the backward compatibility part that is basically for example using wordpress apis like i said like wordpress hooks and and translations using the, the directives that are included in the HTML, those things works out, work out of the box. And with approaches like React, it gets more tricky because even if you support server side rendering, imagine there's an external plugin doing uh, using a filter to modify the HTML, that that's something really common in WordPress. Imagine to add a class, if that class is added in the server, but React doesn't know about that hook, and it's kind of impossible to know all the hooks that are being applied. That class is gonna be is gonna disappear when the, once the hydration happens. It's gonna come from the server. Then React is gonna update the content, but as it doesn't know about the filter, it's gonna remove it. Let's see an example for that. We created this add class hook. I think I don't need this anymore. Yeah, we added a, a hook here that basically we are hooking into the show text block and the show text React block, both blocks. And we are using the HTML tag processor to add a, a red text class. For those who are not familiar with the HTML processor, it's just a new API to, to modify the markup and it's really useful. So basically here, what we are doing is for the show text and the show text React, we are adding the red test class in the in the markup. So let me activate it because it's deactivated. And if we go back to, to the example and refresh it, we can see that it has it had the, the red color, and here in our interactive block is gonna have the red color. But now if I toggle this, it's gonna be blue. And this is because the class has been removed. If we go to the HTML, this we have the div here, and we can see that the red red test class is not here. While in the in the interactive in the block using the interactivity API is here, and that's why it's been applied. And if I disable the JavaScript, just so you see it better, how it comes from the server, we can see that the well <clears throat> here is hidden because what we mentioned that 
with we are able to understand the directives with PHP and with React is it gets trickier. But if we go here to to the div, we can see that the red test class is here. But as far as React starts and hydrates, it's gonna remove it because it's not aware of the hook adding this class. Hope that's clear. <laughs> not sure, but hope that's clear. Something to add? No. Okay. So uh, the, the thing it disappears, the class this the class disappears in the React block because if you go to the React template to the JavaScript, do you ha still have it there? Mm, yep, yeah, I can open it. The class is not there. Yeah. So it's just class hidden text. And when React hydrates, that's what uh, it's kind of the source of truth, right? Yeah, and it's, it's really difficult to know that that class was added because it was added by an external plugin using a hook. So yes. React cannot know. So the external uh, the, the external plugin added to the HTML that didn't add it to the React JavaScript. Yeah. So it's not in the React JavaScript. Yeah, here in the we can see that in the Interactivity API example, we don't have the, that class neither, but as we are using HTML, it's going to be here in the server, so it's going to be applied. And the same way it works with hooks, we could use internal, internationalization functions like this one for our test, and they will work. Oops. Yes. That's what, that was one of the main reasons to make HTML the templating language instead of relying on an external templating language based on JavaScript. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> and related to to that and, and WordPress hooks, we, we can also use hooks to extend functionalities of, yeah, of, of other blocks. For example, here, if we go to, to the movies, let's go to this one, for example, we have the post feature image block that is a figure with an image. This is the HTML. We could use a hook to add some directives here because it's HTML. So the same way we use the hook to add a class, we could use a hook to to add some directives and some, some JavaScript to handle that, that logic. So let's see another example here. We are, well, let me show you first the user experience. I think it's gonna be easier. If I go here and I activate this, imagine this is an external plugin that wants to add Zoom to, to the post feature image. So this is what we are doing, right? I install the plugin and now we can Zoom the, the image while on hover. And we can see that that plugin is adding the some directives that we will see now and some JavaScript that understand these directives. So with that, we can have this zoom effect from an external plugin that is extending the post feature image block that is included in core. So let's take a look at the examples. For this particular example, what we are doing is add zoom to image. We are rendering, we are using the filter to to add this code to any post feature image. And what we are doing, we are using again the HTML tag processor and we are adding data WP context in the figure. We are just saying is to mean false by default. And we are adding two new directives that is data WP on moose move. We are calling this action that is defined in a JavaScript file that we are enqueuing. So we are adding data WP on moose move out is calling zoom and on moose out is calling reset zoom. And here we are again creating a store like we did in, in our interactivity API block. In the zoom example, we are getting the context. We are setting it to context is zooming true. And we are adding some styles to, to add that zooming effect. And then in the reset zoom, we are just changing the context to, to be false. And just with that, well, I also added some CSS, but just with that and enqueuing the JavaScript files, we are extending the core feature image with, with zooming. So this way it's also possible to extend the, 
the well not the directives but you can add directives to existing blocks with this kind of hooks as is usually done in WordPress and apart from that well we didn't mention it but mm, our initial idea is to create an initial list of directives that should cover most of the use cases but it will also be possible to to create your own directives for edge case, ed cases so that's another way of extending this this system and i think that's it regarding block first php friendly backward compatibility and extensibility then we had the declarative and reactive approach i think that's kind of clear we can see here that everything is reactive for example if i go here and i i do this i modify the state directly we are just adding the the godfather movie this is the id for the godfather movie and we are adding adding it to the light movies array so if i add this we can see that everything in the page that depends on this state is automatically updated. We can see the heart here was triggered and the count was applied. So this is the declarative and reactive approach that we are talking about. Then, as we said, we wanted it to be as performant as possible. So, well, I think we haven't mentioned it yet, but mm, this system is using Preact under the hood that is really, really small. And we are using signals for all the declarative and reactive approach. And this make it really performant using React. Oh, no, this one, sorry. I go, let me go here. If I refresh this, this is the JavaScript that is being loaded to to the client. As we can see, is is pretty small. We have the vendors JS file that is the one including Preact and, and all the dependencies. We have the runtime that is including the directives code. We can see that is three kilobytes. And in this case, is because it's using client side navigation, but that's a feature that we wanted to enable, but it's going to be totally optional. So if sites are not using it, this would be would be less size. And then we have the VUES files for the interactive blocks. Apart from that, this is how it's working right now, but we are already exploring ways of optimizing it. For example, we want to only send the directives that are included in the page, or we want to to load the JavaScript code only when the block that needs it is in the viewport. We also want to to take a look so the scripts will load without blocking the page rendering. So the way it's working right now is already performant, but there are ways to optimize it even more. Uh, yeah, I think that's it regarding performance. Then, well, it has to be atomic and composable. We already see that everything is handled by directives that are reusable across the page. And it has to be compatible with the existing block development tooling. For adding an interactive block using the interactivity API, you just have to add the directives to the markup and, and create the store. So the tooling remains exactly the same. So I think that's it regarding the goals. Then it comes with some benefits of using a standard that are block communication. As we have seen, blocks can communicate. When I was liking a, a movie, it was updating another block in the header. It has it has the benefit of composability and compatibility. With this, we mean that you can create extractor of interactive blocks using other interactive blocks, and everything is going to work out of the box. So for other solutions, like imagine there are plugins using React and other plugins using other JavaScript, mm, mm, other JavaScript frameworks, it can get tricky. Both block communication and composability and compatibility can get tricky. It's difficult to make them understand each other. And uh, having a standard, everything works. So that's another benefit of it. And then we have client-side navigation that 
it was showing in the demo. Basically, this is a feature that we wanted to enable for WordPress. We think it's great that WordPress has this capability, but it's important to know that this is going to be optional and opt-in. So yeah, we think for some use cases, it's going to be great to be, have the possibility to do client-side navigation as we are doing with the movies, or maybe with the query loop or WooCommerce could benefit from this. There are some use cases where these could be handy and could be great. It can create great user experiences, but yeah, it's important that it's optional and not all sites will need this. So, so I think, yeah, imagine things like pagination, the query loop, the comments forms, like WooCommerce, or there are many use cases where this is great, but it's going to be optional. <laughs> so yeah, and I think that's it. We can see examples of block communication and composability if you want, or we can jump into the Q and A, whatever you prefer. What we mean with block communication is that if I click this, this is updated. If I click this play trailer, play trailer, this is slow. The play trailer is gonna trigger this other block, so they communicate between themselves. And if we take a look at the code, this one, this one, we can see the, the trailer button in the render PHP file is just calling this action, actions WP movie set video. That is not defined in the movie trailer button. It's defined in the video player, in the view.js file. We have the set video here. So a different block is using an action defined in a different block. And this can also help with plugins. And here we are using the same plugin, but it could be useful to communicate different plugins using the same approach. And with composability, for composability and, and compatibility, we created another example here. We created a block that is well, actually, it's almost the same as the show test that we saw, but it's like a spoiler block where you can include children and it's going to be interactive. It's going to toggle. So if I include here the spoiler block, I can move the movie stuff. That is another interactive block here. And if I save this, let me go now here. If I go to the movies, we can see that we have the show con. This is the spoiler block. That is, it has some directives to hide the content and show it when it's click. And we can see that this other interactive block is here and it remains completely interactive. It can trigger more videos and those things. So everything works. You can nest interactive blocks in other interactive blocks, and as they are using the same approach, everything is is going to work, and you don't have to deal with it. And I think that's it. Anything to add, Luis? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Amazing. Okay. Thank you very much, Mario. Great presentation. Thank you. So I think we've got uh, a question already. Uh, yes, from Carolina. What is the plan for improving accessibility, i.e. screen reader usage, when page content changes without reload. I did not see accessible as part of the goals. Yeah. yeah, we didn't include it because we take it for granted, but for sure, everything we do has to be accessible. And actually, well, I didn't include it in the examples, but with this approach, it's kind of, it's not easy, but you can change the area attributes, for example, using the same directives that we use, like the data WP bind. You can toggle those attributes easily depending on the state. So yeah, it's, it's everything we do has to be accessible and with something we have in mind. Yes, um, we've been talking a lot with Alex Stein and um, yeah, the thing here in this phase of the interactivity API is that, as Mario says, um, these are the primitives. These are like the atomic primitives. So with these atomic primitives, you should be able to build accessible blocks. 
uh, in terms of interactivity. But you need to do that yourself. You need to use those, those directives, uh, those primitive directives. Um, but you can do it. The thing when it's more important to bring accessibility into the conversation is when we start going kind of in a step higher in the abstraction and we start providing components or directives that accomplish more things that are not so primitive, like for example, um, a custom directive or component for a model. So when we expose those, then inside those directives, we need to, yeah, to make sure that they are changing the different uh, area attributes and so on. So that everything, if you use those high level uh, directives or components, then what whatever you do, it's going to be accessible by default. But we are not at that point uh, yet. That's kind of something um, that comes a bit later. It's like uh, when you create a React component, you can make it you can make it accessible using uh, well uh, changing the attributes uh, using use effect to change the focus. Uh, and so on and so on. And you can do the same thing here with the interactivity API is when you use like a, a, a component library for React when those components need like that accessibility kind of baked in. So kind of it, it plays um, the same here, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Hope that uh, answers Can I add question. something? Carolina. Yep, sure, go ahead, Greg. So just like, it's important to know that like the way uh, the websites by default the teams work in wordpress is that you have full page reload which means when you use experiences like the search one is that what you will see that you have like the focus uh, taken outside uh, you know from the input uh, field in the search form to the beginning of the site whenever you navigate to the new result which means that like in that case it's much more complex for someone to get back to the search, you know, start the searching again, which is like this, like by design, it provides you better uh, tools for people who need those assistive technologies because the focus stays in the search. They can continue refining their search without, you know, losing the context. Whereas then they need to tap again to the field and it's like, you know, it's much more work. And if you like look at the other examples that you saw, like the like button, usually you would have to like to have a full full page reload to save the state on the server and get back and then finding your result on the page and like you know doing some interaction is so much more complex. So it's all that is left here just to ensure that all the feedback is provided by using live area attributes and stuff like that, which could be done by developer as well in the first version. We just like we need to like ensure that it's visible. But everything else, just like, you know, it should be so much easier with those paradigms. Thank you, Greg. Okay, I'm glad to see more questions are coming in. <clears throat> That's awesome. So Paul asks, can you share the store code between the editor and the front end, or do you have to create a WordPress data version? Mm, sorry, answer is not right now. <laughs> The, the developer experience for the block editor remains exactly the same as it is right now at this moment. So you cannot use directives in the block editor. It's something that, as, as I said, that we wanted to explore and that we are starting some, some explorations. We want to be able to reuse as much code as possible. But for this initial version, the interactivity API only affects the front end of your blocks. I hope that answers. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say if you have examples where you would want to share data between the editor and, and the front end, yeah, um, please go to the GitHub repo, open a discussion, share examples, use cases. So we also kind of understand uh, the needs. Because right now, yeah, for us, it's not like super clear uh, that the editor and, and the front end like have the same needs. Uh, somehow they're gonna overlap. We don't know if a little bit too much. So yeah, we the the, the more that p 
people start sharing with us about these uh, the use cases and things like that, we can think about solutions to to fill those gaps. Great. And Clement asks, does the interactivity API also trigger side effects like rest requests to save data like the fave movies? Is there already reflections on how this could be achieved? Mm, yes, it's possible. <laughs> in action and effects, you can do basically anything you can do in JavaScript. So, so yeah. You can do it. Actually, there is an experiment in the Gutenberg repo that we are using. Well, it's not REST, but it's for the, well, no, that isn't related, sorry. <laughs> but yes, you can do whatever you can do in JavaScript. So uh, were you going to say uh, the comments form submission? Yes, because, but it's not a REST request. <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's not a REST request. I don't know if we can show it. Um, should, uh, do you want me to show it? Sure. Because sure, it's also ahead. an interesting uh, uh, experiment. Okay. How do I portion of the screen? Okay. Can you see my screen? We I guess so, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, we can link uh, this pull request. So this was, uh, we were trying to do client, uh, client side form submissions for the comments form. And here, what we did was to, well, to add some directives using a, using a, a well, in this case, it was the actual uh, uh, block of the uh, comments form, but you could do this with a plugin. And we are using also the HTML tag processor and we are adding like a directive like Mario showed. So we are adding this uh, core form submission here. And this is the Vue.js. Uh, so what we are doing here in the Vue.js is that, well, uh, this is triggered on form submission. Uh, and what we are doing is we are manually uh, adding a fetch request to the WP comments post HTML, which is what happens with uh, when the uh, with the normal comments, uh, they don't do a REST API request. They just uh, do a post request uh, with a form to this. So we did that with the same uh, form data that uh, the, the server would do, except that we, we did that uh, in the client so we have the result and we can inspect the result and say, okay, uh, if uh, it returned an error, then we are gonna to, we are going to populate the error in the screen. And if not, I'm sorry for the comment, <laughs> I don't know, how can I turn them off? Uh, but yeah, if not, just navigate to the new URL. Okay. And uh, yeah, and here, um, this is uh, how it works. So you just comment here and it's it's gonna appear, the comment's gonna appear here uh, without needing a full repress. If, we, if you keep commenting, it's gonna refresh the screen. And all that is doing is, is not even using the REST API, it's using this, uh, just this fetch, uh, this fetch here to the post comment and the, and the post. And, there, and it's, just, it's using the HTML that it was returned to do the navigation to the next page. So yeah, you can you can here in an action you can call you can fetch and call uh, the REST API if that's what you want, and then you can navigate or you can update the screen, uh, updating the state or context. You're pretty much uh, you can do pretty much whatever you want in an action because this is just JavaScript running on the on the browser. Um, the thing here, oops, sorry, the thing here is that. You can also use um, the old, um, uh, the, the, the regular server-side rendered uh, methods like this post for the comments and reuse that and cre create this um, client-side uh, experience as well. Is that clear? Yeah. <laughs> so you have both Excellent. options there. 
Happy, thank you. Um, okay, that's it for the questions. Any, if you've got it, anybody got any more questions, please just post it in the chat. Um, so I've got a quick... One last thing, Mike. I'm gonna carry on, the, carry on. <laughs> I'm gonna share the link to the examples, just in someone wants to take a deeper look at the code. Let me look for it. I lost it, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is this GitHub repo? This one is for the examples that I saw in the in the demo, and then we can keep all the conversation in the in the blog interactivity experiments repo. We are happy to hear your feedback, your use cases, whatever you have to tell us. <laughs> so yeah. I was just wondering, um, you talked about backward compatibility in your presentation. I'm just thinking about the future, um, the next stages of Gutenberg, the um, uh, you know collaborative working and then translation, which is going to be the fourth stage. Um, how do you see this developing over the next two sort of uh, stages of Gutenberg? I would say that everything that we do for phase three and phase four has to integrate perfectly with this approach. Although right now the interactivity API is mostly focused on the front end. And if I'm not mistaken, phase three and phase four, well, and they are kind of related. But yes, we we have already ongoing conversations of how should the preview of the interactivity should work in terms of UX from the block editor. How can I preview my interactive block? So everything we do for phase three and phase four should work out of the box with the interactivity API. This is like a parallel, I don't know how to say, <laughs> but it has to work. And we are confident that it's not going to be a, an issue. OK, cool. Um... Why did you choose Preact instead of React? Luis, do you want to answer that one? Um, many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Not just a single one. Uh, we only I have a few minutes that, left. <laughs> yeah, I think that I don't know where. Uh, I know that I've answered that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But, um, uh, First, Preact is smaller, so it's uh, more suited for the front end. It's just, um, so we're doing all this with eight kilobytes, which includes Preact, Preact hooks, Preact signals, and two, three kilobytes for the interactivity API on top of that. That's around 10 kilobytes, something like that, which is much, much smaller than Preact itself, which starts, I don't know if it, that's 45, 47 kilobytes. Um, so that's one one thing, but um, well, compatibility with React was also important. Um, so that kind of also um, uh, kind of because uh, sometimes you uh, for very complex React components, so that you don't need a client uh, server side rendering for them, like for example. Who WooCommerce uh, checkout or something like that? Maybe you want to re reuse your uh, editor component and load it in the in the front end, and that's that's uh, also something that uh, Preact is capable of doing so, um, because React uh, Preact has the Preact com Compat layer. Um, it's more performant than React. Uh, also now it has uh, support for signals. Uh, it's also also about performance. Signals are a bit more performant uh, than as sometimes uh, Preact using uh, signals can bypass the VDOM and do apply changes directly to the DOM. So we, we took like uh, performance very seriously. So this is a Preact is, is, is great in that sense. Um, and also, uh, I've lost my uh, thought in there. Oh yeah, we have the we have the link here. 
Oh, it's it's more HTML friendly. Yes. Um, so for things like SVGs and things like that, uh, Preact just works out of the box with uh, what HTML, uh, what the HTML attributes. And in in React, you have to do some kind of translation because it's it, it doesn't support uh, attributes. It needs everything to be in camel case. Um, yeah, and I think well, it give us uh, diffing out of the box. Yeah, I think I'm missing one, but <laughs> which is not in that list. No, I think it's anyway. important. I There's think it's, it's oh yeah, extensibility. Sorry, that mm -hmm. that was it. Yeah, I, I, oh, it's it's there. Okay, Preact is extremely extensible. Yeah, Preact has uh, something called option hooks, where you can hook into into the into their engine. And, and that's where we are hooking uh, for the for the directives. That's uh, yeah, that's probably the the most important options because uh, React doesn't have that extensive uh, extensibility API. So in Preact, we are capable of hooking in and doing things uh, very low level there. Okay, thank you. We've got one last question from Paul because we're just coming up to time now. It's still a proposal, but seems quite usable. And the question is, can we start experimenting with it? Mm, yes, you can, but be aware that it's experimental and the APIs may change. So at your own risk, it's possible. You can install the Block Interactivity Experiments plugin and create your blocks using the Interactivity API, but be aware that the APIs are not definite, so I are not defined. Well, are kind of defined, but they can change. So maybe you create a block now using the interactivity API and it's going to be broken if the APIs are updated. So, and on a similar point, how is this eventually going to be implemented? Will it be a feature plugin or is the plan to, after the proposal stage, to merge it straight into core? Our idea is to, right now it's a separate plugin because we were experimenting with different approaches, but our idea is to include it, it as experimental in Gutenberg first, test it, test it in some blocks, and once we feel confident, we can integrate it into core. Okay, amazing. Thank you very much. Um, we're at time, so I'm not going to take any more questions now. Um, so for those people who arrived late, there is going to be another presentation on this topic at uh, 1700 UTC today. Um, that's a presentation targeted at the America's time zones, and that's going to be done by Michal Kaplinski. Um, So just to wrap up, let me remind you that WordPress is open source. Anyone can contribute, and in particular, people can contribute to the interactivity API as well. I've posted the link earlier, but let me repost the link to the repo uh, once again, in case you want to dig in and uh, see how you can contribute. I'm sure contributions would be welcome. Yeah. Questions sure. and feedback. Yeah. Everything. Also, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Raise issues as well. In yeah. Use cases. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it remains to say thanks everyone for joining and to in particular thank Mario and Lewis for this amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks to you, Thank Michael. you. <laughs> okay, uh, that concludes. Thanks all for joining. Goodbye. Thank you, bye. bye.